And uh, today we want to talk about saving and why people should save. Now, there's a lot of mythology involved in the history of saving. Most notably, there's an Aesop's fable. Uh, it's the fable of the ant and the grasshopper. And uh, I've sent you, I can send out a copy of that so you can read it. There's also a short story about uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, who uh, wrote a little fable called The Ant and the Grain of Wheat. We also have the story of Joseph, who saved during the seven abundant years for the Pharaoh in Egypt. And then seven years of famine came and the Pharaoh was enriched and made more powerful because of his servant's prudence. So um, those are all things we need to know about. But saving is a pretty important thing to say the least. So let's talk about what saving ultimately is. It's essential in an economy that people save or else everybody's, or else you're gonna have just constant problems of starvation. There are always shortages, but if people have no discipline whatsoever and all they do is spend whatever they have as soon as they get it, you have a very, very poor country. And some cultures actually encourage that. They encourage the sharing of abundance with the community when everybody's got it. And then when you're all in poverty, then you're all suffering together. Well, there's something communal about that, but as far as building a, an economy long term, that's not necessarily a good idea. So saving in some ways is a form of abstinence. So abstinence is to hold something back. If you abstain from foods or you abstain from water or abstain from drink or something like that, we all talk about abstinence. We generally think of that as, as an important thing. Saving is also a form of opportunity cost because if you save something, you are giving up what you could buy with it. So if I have, say, uh, a lot of money in my pocket, uh, I might go spend it. But as I speak, we're in the middle of the coronavirus. And right now, things are uncertain. Stock market's uh, gone down rapidly for the last two weeks. It will have a big drop, then it'll rally the next day, and then it'll a big drop. So we're not quite sure what's going on. We're not sure how bad this is going to be. And so as a result, I'm hanging on to all the money I can hang on to, which is what people do. In that way, I'm not really saving so much. Well, you call it saving, but I'm just making sure I don't spend. I try to hang on to my cash as long as possible. And I'm fortunate that I have made some investments in saving, so I'm not like fighting just deprivation right now. So these are all reasons to save. Now let's move on to a couple other things. When you do save something, you can save it in a piggy bank, you can bury it in the ground, you can hide it in the back of the barn, you can put it in a stock market fund, you can buy stocks, you could buy a bond, you could put it in a bond fund, you could buy real estate, you could buy an old car, you could buy a diamond ring, you could buy a gold chain, you could buy all kinds of different things that you might call saving if it is an appreciating asset. Now, a boat is not an appreciating asset, so when you buy a boat, that's generally not saving. A diamond ring could be an appreciating asset, though. Uh, a classic car might be an appreciating asset, but most people who own classic cars do it for the love of it, not because they consider a 1965 Corvette to be the perfect investment. So, uh, saving is a type of abstinence, and there are different ways of doing it. You can also become a lender. And when you're lending, that also has an opportunity cost. If you loan that money to someone, you're giving up the immediate use to it. Now, you might do it just because your nephew is desperate for money. You might do it because your nephew is the brightest kid in the family and you want to help him start a business. And you don't really care that. You want him to succeed, but you don't want him to have to go to the bankers in order to start his business. So there are different reasons to lend. And when you do lend, you have an interest rate. So all that goes in with it. Remember that interest is the amount of money we pay for buying money. That's what interest is. And if you're going to borrow money, you're going to pay for that money. And if you're going to lend money, as a general, you'll be paid. If perhaps by the nephew's affection, if perhaps by the nephew uh, being obligated to you in some other way, depending on your culture. Or if you're a banker, it's just cash flow. It's got a monthly payment and that's what you're putting into your balance sheet that you predict this loan to go through for 30 years or three months or whatever it is. Okay, let's talk about wise and foolish savers. Aristotle said that money does not breed 
and Aristotle's right, money does not breed. Now money is attracted to those who have a clean head about it. It's almost like as money has eyes. So you'll see people who are really good with money and they find money. I mean, two fairly famous people right now, Michael Bloomberg and Donald Trump, they somehow attract money and they always have attracted money. And you could say they were born well or went to the right school or whatever, but there are plenty of people born well or went to the right school who don't attract money. They waste money. But some people just attract money. Now, let's go on to uh, a foolish saver. We have the parable of the 10 talents. That's in Matthew 25. And one servant had five talents and he went to the market and he bought and he sold, he bought and he sold and he multiplied that, those five talents into a total of 10, five more talents. And there was another servant who got two talents and he went to the market and he bought and sold and traded so that he multiplied his two talents into four talents. And then there was another uh, servant and he was given one talent and he was so fearful of the boss he just buried the money in the ground he was so scared of losing something that he buried it in the ground the master comes home from his journey he only has one talent and the master just chastises him and criticizes him and says you're you're worthless i'm going to take your talent away from you and give it to the one with the most talents so saving is an important thing and the people who have the discipline to do it and they are a small fraction of society that discipline themselves to save on a regular, regular basis. And they do amazing things. All right, let's go on to the next thing. If you had $10,000 and you saved it at 8%, and that's a pretty good return right now if you could save something at 8%. But let's say you got an 8% return over 20 years. You're 10 thousand dollars would turn into forty six thousand six hundred nine dollars and fifty seven cents if you got an only four percent return which is a fairly conservative return over 20 years but let's just say you had a safe investment of four percent and that ten thousand dollars would become twenty one thousand nine hundred eleven dollars and twenty three cents that is called the magic of compound interest after you your interest is not just on the original amount of money, but the interest compounds on the money that is paid interest to it. So compounded interest would do that. Non-compounded interest, that wouldn't work. All righty. Forms of saving. You have interest-bearing accounts, such as savings accounts. You could buy some type of whole life insurance, which is kind of like buying into a rainy day fund as well as a death benefit. You could even buy into a pension plan. So they take money out of your regular paycheck, they put it into a pension plan, and over time this multiplies into more than that. Now, let's go to savings in stocks and bonds. We'll just say it real quickly. First thing you need to understand what a corporation is. A corporation is an entity. It's a legal person that can sue and be sued. It can buy things and sell things. They call it a corporation. They're usually chartered by the state. So you could charter a corporation in the state of Alabama, in the state of South Carolina, in the state of New York or Delaware, Nevada, but you charter a corporation. Now, if it's just you and your brother and your sister who own it, then you're still the shareholders, but you don't buy and trade shares. But on the other hand, if it's something like Apple Computer, you buy and sell the shares on the, on the stock exchanges. That's what happens. So that's essentially what uh, you have. You've got a corporation. If you buy stock, you are called a stockholder or a shareholder. In some cases, that stock will increase in value by great, great amounts like Apple did for the last 30 years. Or in some cases, it's not a stock that gets a lot of, of, um, a lot of appreciation in value, but it pays a dividend or something like that. So um, those are different ways you buy stock. You could buy bonds, which essentially means you buy the ownership of the interest in a loan. So if I buy uh, into a bond fund, then all the people who were, have borrowed from off that bond are paying interest and I get paid according to the value of those bonds. I get paid according to the interest on those bonds. So you can be a bond holder. So those are different ways of saving. Another way would be land investments. Now land investments come in three types. Long term, say you own a piece of 
real estate that's investment property. So you own a, a mall or you own a rental house or you own an office or an office building, you own a trailer park or you own a, a beach condo. That would be a, a long-term investment. There are also income investments. Let's say you buy in, so say you buy an apartment building or an office building and it gets good income because it's at a good location. Well, you're going to pay a lot more for that income, but just the same, the income might pay the bills depending on the neighborhood and the type of tenants you have. And then there's speculative investments. So you buy land somewhere out on an interstate 30 miles from a major city and you're hoping if you sit on that land, you buy it for a song. And if you sit on that for land for a, a, a while, then somebody's going to build a hotel on it and you can make money that way. So there are different ways to invest. All right, let's go to a couple other things. We also have compulsory saving versus voluntary saving. In compulsory saving, we'll be paying social security taxes or unemployment taxes. That way, if you retire, you get a little something. That way, if you're unemployed, you get a little bit of something. Or even a Medi Medicaid, a Medicaid tax or Medicare tax, those are also uh, compulsory taxes or compulsory savings programs, but you don't control where that money goes. So your return on investment is going to be fairly small unless you get lucky or unless you say you're disabled for many, many years or you live to be 98 years old. Voluntary saving is where you generally control where that money goes. And that's the most efficient kind of saving because people who are trying to invest money are usually trying to invest it the best they can into good things. And so that's a serious problem when, uh, when people don't control what they're investing in, they quit caring. And on the other hand, if I'm invested in something, I wanna make sure there's more of it when I retire. All righty. Finally, what's this whole savings about? It's ultimately about capital formation. So if I, as an investor, invest in a guy who owns a hundred hotels and he wants to buy a hundred more, and let's just say he buys a hundred more hotels and they're in very profitable markets so that his hotel chain is no longer worth a hundred dollars a share, but it's worth $300 a share, then I've just made a good investment. Likewise, if say I bought shares of a bank that loaned money to people who made real estate investments and they were good at it. Well, likewise, that would be a profitable bank if they make good investments. And all that is capital formation. Or let's just say that you've got somebody who's really good. He's good at the metals business. He knows how to make steel or aluminum products. And let's just say he needs a few hundred million dollars and he builds a, a plant that makes a product that nobody else makes. It sells at a very high price. And as a result, we here in the United States get the profits and the employment from that business. Then we have built capital right here on our own country. And that's really important because if we were not saving and we weren't investing, then we'd be like some country that has very little investment. So if you take a country like Honduras, Honduras has very little investment. Most of the investment is in agriculture. And so Honduras is a poor country, likewise with Guatemala. In contrast, Panama gets a little bit more foreign investment because of its canal, et cetera. Uh, a country like Mexico, despite having some very bad trade policies, currency, crime issues. Mexico does get a good deal of foreign investment because it has inexpensive labor and it's right next door to the U.S. and can import goods into the U.S. or export goods to the U.S. So that's what capital formation is. So essentially, if a business is not visibly growing, it is probably shrinking, whether it's shrinking invisibly or it's shrinking visibly. So these are things that you need to understand. And that essentially is our story of saving. Saving is about capital formation. It is about creating wealth. It's about preserving your own wealth. And instead of going to Vegas and blowing it or buying some car or boat, instead you are putting money into something that's gonna make more money. And overall, we're going to do better because of your investment. That's what it's about.